The challenges that young adults, adolescents and young adults face that are different from their younger and older counterparts are mainly focused on the developmental stage they're in and the the high level of transitions that are going on during these times and that's very different from a younger child whose parents are really kind of fostering them through the process and yes they absolutely miss things they miss school too if they're school age um, but the kind of the impact isn't quite as is, isn't quite the same, I would say, um, because the developmental changes that are happening in that adolescent to young adult window are so so incredible and really kind of long lasting. With older adults, we think of somebody who kind of has a life established already, they know who they are, um, and so you're not interrupting the same kind of developmental process. When a young adult is building relationships after transplant, do they have different priorities than the people that they're interacting with? I, I believe they do, um, based on the, the what's in the literature, what we've seen in research, and also from patients who I work with. Um, the, the real issue comes down to priorities being shifted. So you can even talk to someone as young as 15 years old who after having the experience of, of illness and going through a transplant will say, I just don't care about the same things that my friends do anymore. You know, and they're more worried about their, their hair or their girlfriend or which sports team they make it on. And I'm c more concerned about sort of how my family is, that I'm alive, and what I'm going to do with my life, if I'm ever going to get my life back, how long I'm going to have to be in the hospital. Sort of these things that we think of as kind of larger picture things that a 15-year-old, even a 22-year-old, even a 35-year-old isn't necessarily going to think about otherwise. So there's this also this disconnect with peers um, with their priorities because their priorities are can be a little more serious or a little more mature. Um, but at the same time, they've missed some of the, the growing up and the development that their peers have gone through. So there's sort of this developmental mismatch um, based in these priorities. How would a young person decide if they want to disclose the story of their transplant to the people that they're building relationships with? That's a great question. Disclosing your transplant experience can be really, really challenging. And whether it's disclosing what your original diagnosis was, what going through a transplant was like, um, or sort of what your life looks like now and, and where you think your health and your plans for life will be in the future. And one of the biggest pieces of, of deciding whether or not to disclose to friends or um, even extended family members who weren't part of the treatment process or to romantic partners is really, I would say, two things. One is knowing where you are with that, sort of what is it that I think of myself as a survivor of transplant, and then also recognizing what do I want out of telling somebody. Um, many times when, when survivors are upset with how a disclosure goes, it's because the expectation was unrealistic. I wanted you to do something and I don't have control over what you do. So if I come into the interaction saying, I just want to say this because I want you to know, then that's, then that's a sort of a reasonable expectation that could be met. So I would say it's those two things, really knowing where the survivor is at themselves and recognizing kind of what they want or expect from the interaction. And what would be some typical responses from someone if, if you said, I've had a transplant? From most of the survivors that I talk to, the, the response is usually inquisitive or positive. Every once in a while you do hear the story of like, uh, you know, the, the fear and the, I don't really understand that and I don't know what to do with that and I don't think we have anything in common. But most often, especially for survivors who are out a little bit from their initial transplant, I think a lot of friends, we hear a lot of stories about friends getting scared during the process. Um, usually there's one friend who really steps up and is in it. Um, and then a lot of the other friends fall away. But in terms of long-term survivorship, I would say most of what, what I see is more positive. And people have questions or they don't understand the experience, but there's a level of respect of, you know, respecting that you've had this experience. When these young adults are entering into romantic relationships, mm -hmm. how, how should they decide when they're going to discuss um, the issues of, that come with being a transplant survivor with their potential mate? Uh, that's a great question. And again, I would come back to sort of the same idea as general disclosure with friends or, or other folks is 
Do you know where you are? How do you feel about being a survivor and the experiences you've had and the late effects that you might be experiencing? And what is it that you want from that disclosure? Um, I've talked to survivors and they've said, it's my first date conversation. You know, we go out on a first date and I tell you right off the bat because then you know exactly what you're getting into. And then other folks say, well, I like to wait until they get to know me a little bit because I don't want to be so-and-so the survivor or so-and-so the one who got the transplant. Plant. I just want to be me first and then I want to be a transplant survivor. So they would choose to wait a little bit longer. Um, unfortunately, I don't think there's a, a perfect formula. I think it is really individual, but the more each survivor knows their own thoughts and their own feelings and sort of where they are in themselves with the identity of being a transplant survivor, I think the easier it is to figure all those things out. And what would be some of the issues that a potential mate or partner would have to deal with with the survivor? Um, well, one of them obviously is sort of long-term health issues. What are the late effects of the transplant? What are the added risks being a transplant survivor for other health issues? Um, transplant can also often cause problems with fertility, so many survivors are unable to have children. Um, and obviously for many romantic relationships, that's very important. We've actually heard from some of our teenage survivors, teenage girls saying, well, I don't know why I'd bother have a, having a boyfriend. I can't have kids anyway. Which is absolutely heartbreaking to think that the mindset is the only reason to have a boyfriend would be to have children. Um, but at the same time, that's where these young girls are. And, and there are expectations. And, and there's a lot of social pressure in our society um, that you grow up to get married in order to have children. Um, and so I think that's an area that could definitely be challenging for survivors to talk about. So can you give some suggestions about where survivors could go ab about finding financial resources, particularly for young adults that are going to college or moving out of the house or being on their own? Sure. Um, there are a lot, actually quite a few scholarship funds um, for survivors who are interested in going to college. That's a resource that's, I wouldn't say overly abundant, but definitely present. Um, I would say go to the social worker at the clinic where you got where you either got your transplant or you're getting follow-up care because the social workers will have a list of resources that are local to your area um, and might actually have some resources that are that are just for that clinic specifically. Um, so scholarships are a, a resource that are present. Um, some other resources are a little bit harder to come by. Um, again, if the, if the original diagnosis is a cancer, Cancer and Careers is a great resource for folks managing employment issues um, after transplant. Um, but there are other resources, and, and again, I tap into your social worker for specific resources for exactly what you're looking for. So when someone's going in for a job interview, mm -hmm. we're talking about employment, when they're going in for a job interview, what kind of questions should they ask their employer and what kind of questions is their employer allowed to ask them? Sure. Questions that they should ask their employer, I would strongly recommend asking about benefits and not just health insurance. Clearly that <laughs> is an issue, but one that most people know about and think about. Also think about long and short term disability benefits. Um, how much can you put in and what will the company put in and what are the time frames for long and short term disability? Life insurance is something else it's often hard for survivors to get life insurance without paying out the nose. So asking a new employer about um, life insurance benefits is also helpful. Um, a flexible schedule, if you're still managing um, late effects or if, you know, if you're still dealing with fatigue and things like that, it's helpful to have a flexible schedule at work. Um, and the other piece that I would say is asking about the culture in the office of if everyone's working 80 hours a week and there's an expectation that you never take a sick day and you push, 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 that might not be the best place for a survivor to be able to manage their long-term health. In terms of questions that the employer can ask the interviewee, um, they can't actually ask you about a medical diagnosis. So asking you sort of what has happened or anything about your medical history is not actually within the purview of a job interview. Um, and lots of young adults do struggle with, when do I tell my employer? Do I say something in the interview or do I not? And often those questions um, kind of get, get guided by whether there are 
whether you, the survivor themselves has noticeable effects, um, things that when they walk in the door, the employer might notice, um, or if there are things that they need accommodations for. Um, and being familiar with the Americans with Disabilities Act can also be really helpful going into the interview, because then the survivor knows what is it that I can ask for, and what is it that, they, that an employer can't decide not to hire me because I've asked these questions. So what resources would you recommend um, to help young survivors as they navigate these issues that they're facing that are unique to them? I would say your number one resource is your people. <laughs> Um, and I sort of use that vernacular, but meaning your social network, um, whether it's formal or informal or professional or, or um, what we call a natural support network. Because it's the people around you who know you, your treatment experience, um, and what your needs are going to be. And again, that might include a social worker from the clinic, your um, primary health provider, your oncologist if you were treated by an oncologist, your transplanter. Um, it also will include your friends and your family. Um, there are obviously some formal places to get support. Um, NIH, the NCI actually has a new adolescent and young adult portal on their website which has a lot of great links and places to go related to transplant in general even though it's coming from NCI. Um, uh, Live Strong, again, a cancer-focused organization, but obviously that's a large number of transplants, so there is a significant amount of transplant information. Um, and there's a specific AYA um, portal also on Live Strong's website. So that sort of leads to more formal resources. But at the end of the day, it's really about kind of who's around that survivor and, and what those folks can offer and know that you need. And I think that's the way that most survivors really get connected and stay connected and get the support that they need. So how, do, how does um, a young person's priorities tend to shift after they've come through this kind of a diagnosis and treatment and looking forward on their life? What, what would change in the way that they would approach that? That's a great question. I think that priorities often, often shift to kind of looking at the bigger picture or um, a lot of our young survivors talk about having a closeness with their family, that they're not willing to sacrifice for the sake of friendships. Um, the level of intimacy and trust that they expect in a relationship certainly exceeds that of their peers in general. Um, so their, the priorities of, of peers are obviously developmentally on target. There, there was an important stage to worry about what you were wearing to school and who you were hanging out with and which table in the cafeteria you sat at, um, or if you look at, you know, college age students or new, newly working in, the, in a career field, um, you know, you were most worried about making a good impression at work and getting a promotion. Um, and then in terms of intimacy and relationships, it was about courting and dating and finding that one person and planning a wedding potentially or planning to have children. Um, and, and not that those priorities aren't present for many survivors, but the the, the path we see looks a little bit different. I remember young, one young woman told me a story about she, she used to feel this pressure, this sense of pressure like I have to graduate from college and I have to find a husband and I have to get married and I have to have children and then I have to get a great job and that's what I'm supposed to do and there's an order to it that I'm supposed to follow. And she said, after I finished my treatment and I sort of finally learned that I too was a survivor, it took her a little while to kind of take on that survivor identity. She said, I don't know if I want to do any of that. She said, I know I want to finish school and I know that's important to me. And right now all I want to do more than anything is spend time with my family. And that was really a huge shift, and she's 22 at the time. And her friends are very much focused on sort of living the college life, going to parties, being on sports teams. And she just wants to appreciate her family because they were the ones who were with her through the whole treatment process. So I think that's a good example of, of kind of how priorities shift and, and the impact that it can have on a young adult in terms of relationships. Do young people benefit from having support groups of other uh, people that have gone through transplants? So far what we can see is yes, absolutely. Now the trick is we think of a traditional support group and that's really a model that was built for 
adults um, or parents of young children, but this adolescent and young adult age group isn't really the group that's going to sit around in a circle and have a chat, but what they are doing um, in many communities, there are community-based organizations that are promoting doing activities together, whether it's sports or going to events or attending educational activities, um, but actually doing things together, and that creates that support network or that community. And I know a lot of young people are very active on the online and social mm -hmm. networks. How, how can people find support groups in that arena? I think that's a great, I mean, it's a great resource, especially for people who are living in areas that maybe don't have programs. Um, Planet Cancer, I think, is a fantastic resource. Um, if if you're a survivor of a transplant that, that the, the original diagnosis was cancer, um, there are a variety of other um, platforms um, that, that allow for that virtual interaction even when you can't get the in-person interaction. And do you feel, it, do, do people find that that's as beneficial as the in-person interaction? That's a great question and there's been a little bit of research done in that area. No one's really kind of come to a true conclusion. Um, we do know that there is a benefit to in-person. There's something about sitting in a room together and laying eyes on another physical person who's had a similar experience. But when that's not possible, it seems to me that better to have an online community than no community at all. And Skype is also an option, I would think. And I would think Skype would be a great way to do it, because then at least we can still see each other, um, even if it's not in the flesh. Um, and I think as as our technology improves, um, many of the of the web platforms, I imagine, will kind of integrate a Skype-like um, arena. And how great would it be to be able to sit, you know, in a room and sort of see everyone, even if we were all in our own rooms? Um, but again, I still have to say, and maybe it's the clinical social worker in me, I, I do think that there's something about being in someone's physical presence um, that they will never quite be able to copy 100% virtually, but I certainly think, again, it's, it's certainly a benefit and a, a value added for people who can meet people in real life and then also online, and then for folks who don't have the opportunity to meet people uh, in person.